Okay, let's go straight to the screen. Okay, tonight's lesson is all about anti-Semitism. Israel, the promised land, the screen in front of you. Why does so much hatred center on Israel? That's actually what we're talking about tonight. Why Israel? So Israel, so people tell us they don't hate Jews. They just hate Israel, right? Iran, they only want to annihilate Israel, but they love Jews. They love Jews. They just want to annihilate Israel. Where does this come from? How do we battle it? What do we, how do we combat this, right? What do we do about this, right? Daniel, you ever heard of this? They love the Jews. They just don't like Israel. You know, in Belevachar, we have college campus trips now happening, all of our students engaging in students. And the students, you know, they love Jews, but Israel, ah, we got a problem with Israel. You know, Israel, Israel, Israel. Mm -hmm. So how do we combat this? What do we do with this? Rosie, if anybody knocks on the door, you'll open, yeah? Okay. So as we'll see now tonight, this is just another form of blatant anti-Semitism rearing its head. Criticism is of Israel. <coughs> thank you Aaron welcome welcome Critic Aaron taking both his books here in front of you as well criticism of Israel is blatant pure anti-semitism there's no other words to describe it to say I love Jews but I hate Israel is anti-semitism in its ugliest form so now we are going to see now the first thing we do is um, actually the first thing we do is a beautiful video here which we're gonna show right now, if I can find it. Hold on, second, stop share, share screen. Uh, so far, hold on, okay. The first thing we start off with today is a video. Here we go, one, two, three. On the eastern shore of Manhattan Island, the United Nations headquarters rises from a row of colored flags that represent a multitude of nations. Across the avenue, the Isaiah Wall proclaims a Jewish prophet's vision of universal peace. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The UN's mission is precisely that, to resolve armed conflicts and to foster global harmony. But inside the august chambers of the United Nations, founded in 1945 as a response to a war-ravaged world desperate for coexistence, Isaiah could have easily found himself the target of virulent condemnation had he survived into modern times. Isaiah lived in ancient Israel, that for over a millennia included the territories that the UN considers illegally occupied by today's Jewish state. The Temple Mount that lies at the heart of Isaiah's prophecy is no longer considered by the UN to be the heritage or possession of the Jewish people. Indeed, the tiny country that Isaiah called home has become the focus of the majority of the UN's denunciations and has inspired more censure than all of today's tyrants put together. Iran, North Korea, and other brutal regimes systematically kill their citizens or deny them the most basic of human rights. Israel's northern neighbor, Syria, has murdered tens of thousands of innocent civilians. Apparently, however, that isn't very important in the eyes of the UN General Assembly and Security Council, who continually pass one-sided resolutions that single out and condemn Israel. An overwhelmingly powerful bloc led by the Arab nations promotes a narrow and slanderous agenda meant to isolate Israel. This agenda has met little resistance. The UN's General Assembly votes on 70 to 100 resolutions annually. 15 to 20 of these regularly express disapproval of Israel. From 2016 until 2020, the Assembly adopted 122 resolutions criticizing various countries. 91 of these targeted Israel. That's 75% of all country-specific resolutions. 
And while three quarters of this global forum's written rage lambastes the Jewish state, precious few of the most repressive or blood-soaked regimes on earth have received even a single rebuke. Emergency special sessions of the assembly are rare. During the last 40 years, they've been convened for one purpose only, to condemn Israel. The assembly's embrace of a terrorist entity has been equally astounding. In October 1974, 14 years before the Palestinian Liberation Organization even nominally forswore terrorism, the assembly voted to invite a PLO spokesman to take part in its deliberations. This was the first time that anyone who was neither a government representative nor a head of a quasi-state was granted such a privilege. The following year, the assembly awarded the PLO permanent representative status. A few months later, the UN infamously approved Resolution 3379, branding Zionism as a form of racism. At the time, Israel's UN ambassador, Chaim Herzog, told his fellow delegates that Hitler would have felt at home listening to the UN debate on the measure. For us, the Jewish people, this is no more than a piece of paper, and we shall treat it as such. Since the 1993 Oslo Accords, hundreds of Israelis have been killed and thousands injured by Palestinian terror attacks. During the same period, the UN passed dozens of resolutions deploring Israel, but not one against the terror attacks. Since the 2006 creation of the UN's Human Rights Council, most of the world's human rights abusers have suffered nary a mild rebuke. Israel, on the other hand, is chastised as often as all of the rest of the countries combined, and in terms more condemnatory. At the Council's every meeting, a topic billed as, quote, human rights situation in Palestine and other occupied Arab territories, is raised as a separate agenda item, while the remaining totality of mankind constitutes a single other point on the agenda. From 2006 to May 2021, Israel was condemned in no less than 94 Human Rights Council resolutions. During the same period, Syria was condemned 36 times, North Korea 14 times, and China has been spared condemnation altogether. Even within the walls of the UN, the absurdity of its anti-Israel bias is fleetingly, partially acknowledged. In September 2006, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan conceded. Supporters of Israel feel that it is harshly judged by standards that are not applied to its enemies. And too often this is true, particularly in some UN bodies. In August 2013, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon reflected on Israel's treatment at the UN. There are some bias against Israel, Israeli uh, people and government. In December 2016, he told the UN Security Council. A disproportionate volume of resolutions, reports and conferences criticizing Israel. One of the more telling comments came inadvertently in November 2013, when a UN interpreter failed to silence her microphone as she addressed her colleague. I mean, I think when you have five statements, not five, like a total of ten resolutions on Israel and Palestine, there's got to be something. I mean, I know it's a, yes, yes, it's right, but it's not the, oh, there's other really bad happening, nobody says anything. But the other stuff. Apologies. Okay, I understand there was a problem with interpretation. Israel is not larger than 8,019 square miles in total. It is the Middle East's only functioning democracy and champion of human rights. It is a world provider of humanitarian disaster relief and medical, agricultural, ecological, scientific, technological, and security innovations. But when seen through the lens of historical UN bias, the overwhelming majority of all the world's evils and all of the world's ills belong to the tiny Jewish homeland in which Isaiah spoke his vision 
of swords being beaten into plowshares. Okay, so tonight is so critical, so vital to understanding um, this Israel situation. Here we go. All right, come inside. One second. Wait a You come here one second. No, I think I figured it out. How do I make this bigger? This thing's in my way. I need to make it bigger. That thing's in my way. No, I'm in the right one. Okay. Second, play from start. We got it. Oh, we got it. Okay. Okay, so text text number one in, in, in front of you, okay? This is from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, very, very important. And this is so crucial to understanding because, you know, when you lie so much, the lies like seep into us and it's almost like, oh, one second, maybe there's something wrong with Israel. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, should be nice to the Palestinian, whatever, whatever that is, right? Let's see. Anti-Semitism, the rights Rabbi Sachs, is not an ideology, a coherent set of beliefs. It is in fact, an endless stream of contradictions. The best way of understanding it is as a virus. Anti-Semitism is a virus. Viruses attack the human body, but the body itself has an immensely sophisticated defense, the human immune system. How then do viruses survive and flourish? By mutating. Anti-Semitism mutates, and in so doing, defeats the immune system set up by cultures to protect themselves against hatred. Most people at most times feel a residual guilt at hating the innocent. Therefore, anti-Semitism has always had to fight, find leg leg legitimation in the most prestigious sorts of authority at any given time. In the first centuries of the Common Era, and again in the Middle Ages, this was religion. This is why Judeophobia took the form of religious doctrine. In the 19th century, religion had lost prestige, and the supreme authority was now science. Racial anti-Semitism was duly based on two pseudosciences. Social Darwinism, the idea that in society is a nature the strong survive by eliminating the weak, and the so-called scientific study of race. By the late 20th century, science had lost its prestige, having given us the power to destroy life on Earth. Today, the supreme source of legitimacy is human rights. That is why Jews or the Jewish state are accused of five primal sins against human rights, racism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, attempted at genocide, and crimes against humanity. So the screen in front of you, historically, modern video we did, one second, a mutating virus. So in the early stages, religion, early common era, middle ages, I think you also have a picture in front of you. You have a picture in front of you, like 3.1, should be a picture there. Right, classic era and middle ages. Like everybody respected religion. Yeah, you have run it. Everybody respected religion. So Jew, Jews, Judaism was the enemy of religion, right? They killed our savior. They go against Muhammad. They this, they that. Right? By the way, I think Haman said that their religion is different from ours. Right? It was religion. The 19th century, science was like the main prestige. And so they said the inferior Jewish race is infecting the superior Aryan race. In the late 20th century, it, after the Holocaust, right after Nazi Germany said it's all about science. So now they say human rights, Israel is a violator of human rights. Like human rights is holy. And the Jews, is, not the Jews, sorry, we love the Jews. Israel is against human rights, right? That's what they say, right? It's, it's like our sex put it beautifully with a virus. It's a virus, it's a mutating virus. That's what it is. In other words, hatred of Jews seeks legitimacy it makes sense intellectually to hate the jews i don't hate the jews i love the jews i just hate those people who go against my religion or science or human rights um right the christians the muslims haman and then came hitler in the 19th century um and after the holocaust right, it's all about human rights okay figure 3.2 in front of you which of the following best describes you? Right? Are you look at the, look at the figure in front of you? Which of the best describe you? Are you generally pro-Israel and supportive of these Israel government's policies? Are you generally pro-Israel but also critical? Are you generally pro-Israel but also critical of many of the current Israeli policies? Generally not pro-Israel. Which one are you? Most of you are here fall under. Aaron, which one are you? You generally pro Israel and support of the government's policies. Anybody critical of the government's policies? 
I'm critical of government policies. I'm very critical. Yeah. So you prefer not to get involved? Yeah, get involved. Okay. But I'm still critical of the government's policies. I'm very critical. I'm very against a lot of things. And I, you know, but I love Israel. I absolutely love Israel. And I'll do anything to support Israel. I love it. But in other words, by me, it's not a contradiction. Of course, I disagree. As a Jew, as an Israeli, you know, I disagree with everything. Anybody, everywhere, right? Jews, we have different opinions. But it doesn't mean I hate Israel. I love Israel, right? I mean, we're, we're not happy with what's going on here. I mean, why should that country be any different? You know? Yeah, correct. So how, so the screen in front of you asks you the following question. How might we differentiate between legitimate criticism of Israel and criticism motivated by anti-Semitism? Like me and David here, we don't agree on a lot of things, but I love him. <laughs> but we don't agree. There's many, many things we don't agree. How do I know we don't agree? Because we two, we're two Jews. Jews, we don't agree on a lot of, we just don't agree. Right? But doesn't mean I don't love him. So you can legitimately criticize Israel. I have no problem with that. But how do we know if that's motivated by anti Semitism or not? Um, the what? I say it depends who's talking about it. Depends who's talking about it. The problem is, as we'll see, Mendel, please stop that. As we'll see, the problem is that this anti Semitism is not just seeped into Muslims and it's yeah. Jews as well. Of course. A lot of Jews. Yes. Right. Right. Um, so the Medrash tells like this one formula of differentiating is in text number two. Okay. So this guy is, it's a Medrash, Imikantron. We don't know who Imikantron was. We don't know who he was, but he wrote to Emperor Hadrian. If it is circumcision that you hate, the Arab tribes also circumcised, right? Because he made a law. No Jews are allowed to circumcise and no Jews are allowed to work on Shabbat, uh, to, to, to keep Shabbat. So if it's circumcision, the Arabs also do it. If it's Shabbat observance, you spies. So the Kutim similarly observe Shabbat. Clearly then you simply hate the Jewish people and their God will exact punishment from you. In other words, he justified the brutality upon the Jews because he says, oh, they, don't, they, they, they keep Shabbat and they do the Brit and, you know, that's it. So they told him other people do it as well. So he had no answer. He just hated the Jews. He was looking for an excuse to do it. But there's something called the 3D test. Famous, famous. Anybody heard of 3D test? 3D test? You heard of it, right? Yeah, no? it's from, uh, what's his name? Uh, yes. Who? Uh, Sharansky. Sharansky. Anybody else heard of 3D test? Yeah. 3D test is very, very famous, and it's like, um, it's, it's all over the world, basically. To determine if it's anti-Semitism, 3D test is in front of you. 3Ds, basically. Text number three. Natan Sharansky wrote, I believe that we can apply a simple test. I call it the 3D test to help us distinguish legitimate criticism of Israel from anti-Semitism. Number one, the first D is the test of demon demonization. <clears throat> When the Jewish state is being demonized, when Israel's actions are blown out of all sensible proportions, when comparisons are made between Israelis and Nazis and between Palestinian and refugee camps and Auschwitz, this is anti-Semitism, not legitimate criticism of Israel. Right, so that's number one, demonization. Number two, double standards. The second D is the test of double standards. When, is, when criticism of Israel is applied selectively, when Israel singled out the United Nations for human rights abuses while the behavior of known major abuse of China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria is ignored, when Israel's Magen David Adom alone among the world's ambulance services denied admissions to the National Red Cross, that's anti-Semitism. Very simple. In other words, you can criticize Israel and say that Israel is problem with human rights. You can say that. That's not a problem. But if the only country you demonizing is Israel, then that's double standards. Then that's not. In other words, what's motivating you is not loving human rights. It's, de it's hating Israel. Okay? And the third D, delegitimization. De the third D. When Israel's fundamental right to exist is denied alone among all peoples in the world, very simple it's anti Semitism. So when you say right to exist is denied, but there are people who say Israel can exist, but they just have to give a portion of their land back. So is that, is that anti-Semitism? Um, like when they knock off the two-state solution? Like it's fine that you're there, but they also need to be there. Right. So we'll see very soon that that is a very sophisticated form of pure anti-Semitism. 
pure and anti pure anti-Semitism. Let's see. Let's, Actually, we'll, yeah. we'll get there. It gets tricky oh. trying to distinguish. It could be like a form of political blackmail to say like any I'm obviously very supportive, say any criticism is anti Semitic. It's like you have to be very careful like, how you understand the differences. Right. You know? Correct. And, and again, I'm not talking about left wing and right wing. You know, I, I'm sure there's people here on the left wing, people on the right wing. I mean, I happen to be heavy duty, heavy, heavy, heavy duty right wing, but that's got nothing to do with it. Right? Let's see. Well, I think it has got to do Okay. Is well, let's see. The, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's going to come up later in the class. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the 3D test on the screen in front of you, we did that. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay, so the, ne the next thing we need to understand is what can we do about this? So what can we do about the 3D test? What can we do about the fact that Jews, Jews are joining this cause? That's the problem. If it's our enemies who hate us, that's one thing. But once it seeps into Jews, how, what, what can we do about this? I mean, obviously we're sending beloved soldiers in college campuses. And I just heard our soldiers are in Stockton University. I don't know what that is, by the way, but Stockton University, and there's a massive, massive Muslim protest. So the Chabad rabbi just asked me, now, should I move it to the, Chabad asked, should I keep it by the Muslims? I said, keep it right there. Don't cower. We don't move things because the Muslims are there. So <laughs> that was just my mess. Anyway, so what can we do about it? So there's something called Haman anti-Semitism, and there's something called Antiochus anti-Semitism. Okay? And it's crucial, crucial to understand the difference between Haman anti-Semitism and Antiochus anti-Semitism. Haman. Haman, Haman, uh, but we learned last time that Haman and Antiochus were equal in their, in their hatred, Antiochus, Antiochus was in which period, which holiday, Hanukkah, the Hanukkah anti-Semites and the Purim anti-Semites, no Jew today in his mind or her mind, unless they mentally read crazy, would join the Haman anti-Semitism today, but the Antiochus anti-Semitism Jews flock to. And I'll explain what that means first and how. Okay. So let me see if the screen in front of us expands. Okay. Okay, let me explain what it is. Let's use that. Okay. Let me explain, then we'll get to the text in front of us. Haman anti Semitism says, I want to destroy all the Jews. I want to kill the Jews. So I hate the Jews. I just hate the Jews because I hate the Jews. I want to destroy them. That's the bottom line. But Antiochus anti-Semitism says, I don't hate Jews. I love Jews. I love the Jews. They're good, good, good people. All I want to do is I want to change certain things. I don't want them to keep the Torah. I don't want them to keep the mitzvot. But I love the Jews. Right? To certain aspects of their religion I don't like. And that is a sophisticated form of anti-Semitism, which traditionally Jews have flocked to. Think of the KGB, Stalin, who founded the Yevesketia, the J Jewish Brigade, was Jews. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to learn this in more depth now. But look, look at the force, uh, 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 source in front of you. Okay, so, source number four. Hanukkah anti-Semitism doesn't demand dead or expel Jews, at least not at first. Instead, it demands the destruction of Jewish civilization. This process requires not dead Jews, but Jews who are willing to give up whatever specific aspect of Jewish civilization is deemed to be uncool. Of course, Judaism has always been uncool, which is why cool people find it so threatening, why Jews who are willing to become cool are absolutely necessary to Hanukkah style anti Semitism success. In the days of Antiochus, this type of anti Semitism needed those boys who voluntarily underwent painful genital surgery to prove that Jews weren't the problem, just the barbarity of Jewish law, right? Antiochus said, Bris is, is uh, not allowed. So a lot of Jews went and had surgeries to reverse their Bris, right? This is a like, historical fact. Hanukkah-style anti-Semitism always promises Jews a kind of nobility, like, oh, you're part of us, you're, you know, offering them the opportunity to cleanse themselves of whatever the people around them happen to find revolting. The Jewish traits designated as repulsive vary by country and time period, but they invariably contradict the specific values that the surrounding culture has embraced as universal. Thanks to Judaism's incoherent cool uncoolness, there will never be a shortage of Jews willing to comply. 
So when Antiochus was around, it was the Hellenist belief, the Greek culture, they worshiped the human body. They worshiped like meat, sports, culture, and all that. So the Jewish body, bris, that was like something, oh, well, that's uncool. So they said, we love Jews, we love Jews. No problem, just specific aspects of Judaism we don't like. And uh, Antiochus uh, was fought by the Maccabim. The like, Maccabim fought against this because they realized that this is purely anti-Semitism. And if we don't fight it now, it's going to kill us. It's going to destroy the Jewish religion. So what can we do about it? I hope you're not paying anything in this book here. Yeah? Let me just see. So today's day and age, the Antiochus anti-Semitism is Israel, human rights. Israel's violating human rights, and they are going and they killing the poor Palestinians, and they machine gun it, right? It's, it's all over the world. So it's, so it's seeping into our culture, and Jews are like, oh, one second, yeah, I love Jews, but Israel, no, it's not, it's, it's not the right thing to do. But it's important to understand that's where it comes from. You can't get a Jew to say, no, we need to call, kill all the Jews, like Haman. No, that Jews won't cross that border, at least now. But Hanukkah style they will. Okay. 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 So number one, the screen in front of you. What can we do about it? Number one, support organizations that help advance Israel and Israel's interests. Um, right, we gotta do a better job explaining to Jews why. It's so important to have Israel engaged in spiritual endeavors to support Jews in Israel. That's how we learned last week that it's got to do with the spiritual as well. By the way, the, on the, in the Chabad conference, there was a most unbelievable story. I shared it on my Facebook. I sent it out, but I, so I'm sure some of you saw it. But briefly, the Chabad rabbi, I can't even pronounce the city he's in. It's the capital of Siberia, Novosibirsk or something. Let's go. Novosibirsk. So he said when he married, he said, are we moving on Shlichot to his wife? His wife said, I'm prepared to go anywhere in the world except Russia. That's what she said. Anyway, I'll go anywhere, anywhere. South Africa, Japan, just not Russia. So when they got married, they were looking for shlichut, and somebody introduced them to Rabbi Beryl Lazar, who's the chief rabbi of Russia, and they told him, we are prepared to meet you, but you should know we're not going to Russia. So he said, no problem. I have this amazing city. It's called Novosibirsk. He said, it's nothing to talk about. I'm not going there. So the rabbi Lazar said, fine, I get it. You're not going there. You know what? Visit there, I'll pay you a vacation. Just go on vacation there for like two weeks or something. You know, so that's what he did. He went on vacation there with his wife. He's there, he's whatever, he's talking to people. Anyway, while he's there, there was a pogrom in the main synagogue in Novo Sibirsk. A pogrom meaning full on anti Semitic pogrom all the way. The Torahs were destroyed. You look at the video, it's unbelievable. You see it. And basically, the, the, the Rabbi Lazar, you know, something like this happened. So the guy calls Rabbi Lazar right away. What should I do? Now, I'm 24 years old. He was a student. He just got married. He doesn't know. He has no experience. He's like, about learn. We learn on the job. So Rabbi Lazar said, call all the media right away. We need to document this. We need to video this. So then right away, the media comes. This rabbi never been interviewed in his life. Doesn't speak a word of Russian. Never mind. He's with a translator. And they ask him, are you the, uh, what, what's your title here? What, are you the chief rabbi here? So he said, yeah, I'm the chief rabbi of Novosibirsk. <laughs> What's he supposed to say? I'm, I'm, I'm the chief rabbi of Novosibirsk. <laughs> so, I mean, they asked him, like, what is your connection? What are you doing here? Like, are you the rabbi? Are you... So he says, yeah, I'm the rabbi. They asked him, are you the chief rabbi here? Said, yeah, I'm the chief rabbi. So that's how he became the chief rabbi of Novosibirsk. He said, if I'm here already, so because of the pogrom, because of anti-Semitism, he's there. And on the video that he showed Kamal Kinnis, his daughter got married this past summer in Novosibirsk. So he said he didn't want to go there, but the Rebbe pushed him, and because of anti-Semitism, it made him stay there, and he, anyway, the rest is history. So, engage in spiritual endeavors to support My Israel. My parents were both there and during the Holocaust. In Novosibirsk? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they survived? Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So you know, you know, you know the show well, so you see the video I sent out? I did not see that. Oh, you, now you got to watch it. Yeah. It's an, it was the best story of the whole Kinnis Ashlokim, the whole five-day weekend, the best. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Already below or something. They yeah, said you, you, they would have to like uh, keep touching their nose so it doesn't fall off. Right? Yeah. yeah. But now we need to understand what is the basis of the Jewish right to Israel. Can anybody tell me what's why why what what's the basis of the Jewish right to Israel? Why do we why are we allowed to be in Israel? What would be the main reason you would say? Indigenous. Okay, from when? From uh, Joshua. 
So it means we were always there. We lived there. We lived there, right? Okay, what else? We created our culture there. We created our culture there, which is very much to do with indigenous same ideas, our culture, we'd be living there. What else? What is our claim to Israel? We also won a war. We won a which war? 1948, okay. We won in 1948, yeah. What else? There were Jews there the whole time, so from, yeah, from the yeah. beginning of history. From the beginning of history. Indigenous, the same. It's the same. No, but continuation. Continuous also. Fine. And then the... Someone's from Russia. What else? Praying for Israel every day and wanting to return. The Bible teaches our Purchase land there, like there's visual purchase records. It is ours, but Okay. So it is ours. So I would say there's three things here. Let me see if it's on the screen as well. Okay, hold on a second. The screen has here. See, when Jews join, Jews join forceful with haters, gives them a legitimacy. But this is the danger of Jews joining with the anti Semites because it gives them the legitimacy and strength. Like, the anti semites this is so dangerous. They say, oh, even the Jews support us. This is why it's so dangerous when the Jews are not united and some Jews go with anti-Semites. But two forms of anti-Semitism, which we just learned. Uh, one is a Purim anti-Semitism, wanting to destroy the Jewish people. Another one is a Hanukkah anti-Semitism, eradicate specific beliefs and practices. So the Hanukkah anti-Semitism, it's easy for Jews to join. They don't have to renounce their Judaism. They feel like they're saving Judaism, right? The people, the people sophisticated today who are anti-Israel say, we're saving Judaism. We don't want the Jews to be anti-human rights. And it's like sophisticated worldview. That's what it is, really. What about the uh, Satmar sort of? Um... The Satmar who don't... Uh, well, the ones that show up at all the... At all the so um, first of all, important uh, to note, it's not the Satmar. So it's the Naturi Karta, which is very, very important. The Satmar is massive. It's probably the biggest Hasidic sect. And they are not Satmar. The ones who show up are not Satmar. They're not even a fringe. They are a different section. They're called Naturi Karta. They're not Satmar. Satmar don't recognize Israel, but they would never meet Iran. They would never protest against those things. They, they wouldn't do that, no. Um, okay. Israel anti-Semitism. Same idea. See what? See the screen? What happened? They ju he just look at this. This is brilliant on the screen. See Hanukkah anti is exactly that. And then all he changed was on the screen Israel anti but it's the same thing. You don't have to renounce your Judaism. You're saving Judaism, and it's a very sophisticated worldview because we we're against Israel. We love Jews, right? So what is the Jewish claim to the land of Israel? So there's three main main things which you would find in the world today. And this is so critical to understanding and countering the arguments. See, argument number one, I don't think it's in the source in front of you, but on, uh, argument number one would be, look at the screen, common arguments, international law, right? One argument would be international law. I mean, Israel is, if you look at pure international law, Israel has a right to exist, right? We did, we did the, the Belfort Declaration, His Majesty, the government decided, and we split up Israel and the UN partition in the whatever. Now, you know, international law, we, we have a right to exist, right? That would be one pretty strong argument for Israel's right to exist. Second argument would be Jewish survival, right? One of the driving forces behind the modern, modern Zionist movement is because you need to ensure that, that uh, you know, Jews survive, right? 2,000 years of persecution, pogroms in Russia, uh, Nazi and destroyed six million Jews. So we needed to ensure the Jewish survival. So in 1948, the greatest argument that Jewish state of Israel needs to exist is because of the Jewish survival, right? Very simple. And the third argument would be history. History would mean a historical, like you said, indigenous. It's a historical right. We're there for so many years. I mean, we've been there. We're, we've been living there on and off for thousands of years, so that's our right to exist. That's, that's our right. Do, do these three make sense? Which one is the most powerful of all three? History. Which one? History. history? Okay. Okay, the problem with all three of these is very simple. The arguments are very, very strong, but every one of them could potentially have a very strong counter argument. Who can think of the, let's go to the first one, international law, what would be the counter argument to that? Every what? Every 
So we should make a new treaty now in 2021 and destroy the international law one, but under, uh, but, uh, under what reason? For what reason? No, I can understand what happens because there is a treaty in place. If circumstances come up that it validates the law, you mean potentially it could, things could come up? Potentially, right? No, it's like all okay. the borders fall away. What about Jewish survival? Jewish what would be a counter argument to that? Jewish can survive in the Netherlands. Jewish can survive in the Netherlands. As Theodore Herzl asked for Uganda. Right. What about history? Well, they invent a counter history that the Palestinians are the Pishtim. Palestinians are the Pishtim, right. <laughs> right. Okay. So. Common arguments, see that on the screen? Common arguments of this? Counter arguments. Common arguments, you see it's the exact same thing, counter arguments. Here you go. International law, you could counter and say the declaration was immoral. You could say the declaration made at that time didn't factor in the Palestinian rights. And you could come up with sophisticated rules that it's a null and void. The international law made then, if we would have known all the arguments, whatever, that had no right. Jewish survival, very, very simple. Why as well? You could let them have Uganda. And you could not only that, you could say you can make a counter argument. You could say that Jews, in order to survive, it's actually better that they don't have a state of Israel. Why is that? All the eggs in one basket. Very simple. When you have... When you have an Iranian threat, it's going to kill all six oh, million yeah. Jews living in Israel. But imagine Israel would be dispersed all over the world. It'd be great, right? You don't need it. <laughs> Very simple. Right? If you, if you sophisticatedly choose and pick, you can do that. History doesn't generate eternal right to the land. Okay, I was there for three, four thousand years. Let's say, fine. But that doesn't mean I should be there for the next billion, billion years. Right? What's, what's three, four thousand years in the face of a billion years? Or eternity? Okay, I was there for 4,000 years. Thank you so much. Your time's up. Adios. Okay. And therefore, okay, let's, let's first look at text number five. Text number five in front of you. When I was a Jewish kid growing up in suburban Los Angeles, this is from Phyllis Bennis. Oh, did I just, oh my God, please don't tell, turn this off. I wouldn't have to turn it back on. Reza, can you call Mendel, ask him to come here, please? Okay. When I was a Jewish kid growing up in suburban Los Angeles, we thought about doing, that being Jewish meant supporting Israel. Right, I was a Jewish kid. Being Jewish, you know what I mean? Supporting Israel. There really wasn't a choice. If you identified as Jewish, as I and most of my friends did, the religious education we got, the youth groups we joined, and the summer camps that we paid for were all grounded in one thing. It wasn't God. It was Zionism, the political project of settling Jewish people in Israel. My own break with Zionism came in my mid-20s after reading the letters of Zionism's founder, Theodore Herzl, imploring Cecil Rhodes, um, the leader of British land theft in Africa, to support his work in Palestine. Their projects were both something colonial, Herzl assured Rhodes. So this lady was basically raised where a place where Israel was a major point of emphasis, but it didn't last. Because once she read, you know, these ideas, why did I know? Once she read these ideas, um, you know, the, the whole idea of the values of the state of Israel ran contrary to what she held, she held so dear, then, you know, they weren't impressed. And therefore, the key is Jewish education. Okay? Jewish education. Okay, and that Jewish education is key. The first Rashi in the entire Bible is something that is the key, which holds the idea that this is the Jewish people's claim to Israel. Okay, Jewish education, the very, very first Rashi. Um, okay. 
Okay, the very first Rashi in Torah. Let's read it. Text number six in front of you. Rabbi Yitzchak stated, this is on the verse, Bereshit parai lo kimet hashemayim ta'as, God created the beginning heavens and earth. So Rashi writes, Rabbi Yitzchak stated, the Torah should have begun with the first mitzvah commanded to the Jewish people. So let's just look at that. The Torah has five books of Moses, Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Bamidbar, Dvarim. Bereshit is all about the stories of Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, till Joseph and his brothers went into Egypt. Shemot starts with the Exodus, all the way to the you know, desert. Vayikra Bamidbar Dvarim is all the, the 40 years in the desert. So Rashi says the Torah should have started not with the stories of the Bible, not with the stories of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, but with the first mitzvah in the Torah. Who knows what the first mitzvah in the Torah is? Rosh Chodesh. The Torah should have started with the first Chodesh. What's it relevant to know that there was a guy called Abraham, the world was created in seven days, Isaac, a whole story. Why just start with the first mitzvah? So Rashi answers. For what purpose does it start for, with in the beginning God created heaven and earth? The solution is found in the verse. He recounted the strength of his works to his people to give them the inheritance of the nations. In other words, if the nations of the world accuse the Jews with the claim, you are thieves. Oh, it's working. You are thieves for having conquered, for having conquered the lands of the seven nations. If one day the non-Jews will come to the Jews and say, you are thieves, you conquered our land. Israel belongs to us. Right? The Jews should reply, ah, 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 the entire world is God's. He created it, as we know, Bereshit, Barai, Lokim, Meta, Shemayim, Meta, and he granted it to whomever he desired. It was his will to initially give it to the seven nations, and it was his will to subsequently remove it from them and give it to us. Okay, and now we have the screen. So, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. It is God's will. See, Bereshit Barai Lakim tells us that the world belongs to God. Israel belongs to God. America belongs to God. China belongs to God. And Jewish claim to Israel is because he chose to give it a piece of it to us. That is our claim to Israel. Any other argument, international law is, is flawed. Indigenous is flawed. Jewish survival is flawed. But when you look at it, that it's God's land and he gave it to us, that's it. It's, it's, he gave it to us, it's our present. Finish, end of story. The gift is eternal. But who does this convince? First of all, we need to convince ourselves. That's the first people. Once we are convinced, we can share it with others. If we understand something, we can, we can share it with us, with us. The problem is we are not convinced. That's the problem. International. With, um, the, if not now, Bibi Netanyahu went and gave a copy of this Rashi to Barack Obama in office. He gave a copy of this Rashi to Obama. So Bibi thought it worked. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, at least he thought. I don't know if it worked or not. I don't know, but he thought it worked. Obama didn't end up talking. <laughs> right. I don't know if it was because of that Rashi, though. Okay. God said to Abraham on the screen in front of you, all the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. That is our claim to Israel. Okay. Text number seven in front of you. God told Abraham, raise your eyes and look around from where you are to the north, the south, to the east, the west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. This promise was reiterated to Abraham, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov. When God took the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, he told them, I'm leading you to the promised land. For thousands of years, Jews have known this is Israel. This is our land. Even though we had no political control over it, we always were indigenous. We always were there because the Torah says that this gift is eternal. Didn't, didn't Abraham give half the land to Lot? No. They went different directions. Went different directions, but right. you didn't but give said, him the land. You, live, you take this part, I'll take this part. Anything you take, you go there. You go there, I go there. <laughs> you go live there. Um, but if you raise Jews with a little appreciation for Torah, then yeah, maybe they won't appreciate this first. And that's why you have to raise Jews who appreciate Torah. Because the first people we need to explain this to is ourselves. Now, will this argument be effective against non-Jewish anti-Israel voices? Hopefully. But we need to convince ourselves first. Okay, text number eight. This is a letter from the Rebbe, okay? Um, it's, it's a long letter of the Rebbe to President Schneir Zalman Shazar, the president of Israel. Um, 
it's a long, long letter. The Shazar complaining about a couple of things the Rebbe said about Israel, whatever, whatever it is. But in this letter, what's relevant to us is this part. The Rebbe writes, I've received complaints. Why do I invoke the biblical land of Israel? Like the Rebbe is always saying, the biblical land of Israel, like Eretz Israel and the Holy Land, like and the covenant with Abraham in connection with modern Israel. Like, why? They, as I said, I claim to the land is from 1948. He wrote to him in a letter. Like, why do you say no? It's it's biblical Israel. It's it's it's, 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 it's you know. Why do I mix God into the picture? After all, they say those who fought for the creation of the state, those who led it, those who currently direct it and its authorized representatives, they all proclaim and take pains to emphasize that Israel is a state founded in 1948. My answer, put frankly, says the Rebbe, is that their narrative is false. No new entity was created in 1948. Rather, that was the year in which a large part of the land of Israel was liberated. But that wasn't given to the Jews then. It was just liberated. It went back to us after being ours for so many years. The entity established in 1948 based on the agreement or authorization of the nations of the world has no strength or justification in terms of an authentic response to the claims you are thieves for conquered lands belong to others. The Rebbe was adamant that if we believe that our claim to Israel is from 1948, then it's a claim that is very shaky. A claim raised by the Arabs, Vatican, the United Nations, some Jews as well. And that's why it's so crucial to underscore that it is our God-given homeland. Now, I do not delude myself into imagining that these just and honest arguments will prevail in the United Nations, the Vatican, etc. Nevertheless, transmitting this truth is critical for the morale of the Jewish youth living in the Holy Land, including those serving the IDF, for Jewish American students and for the Jewish youth of other countries as well. We need to emphasize how the land of Israel belongs to us because it's the promised land. Okay, this Are these videos in online? Uh, all these videos yeah. online, yes. Every single one of them, yeah. The Rebbe, by the way, the Rebbe was with so many of this. The, 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 there's a whole series, the Rebbe in the land of Israel. By the way, the Rebbe spoke to nearly every president, every Mossad chief, all of them. There's dozens and dozens of, I mean, interviews, everything. Every single Israeli that you know from 1948 have all been to the Rebbe, all of them. Left wing, right wing, Rabin to Shamir, ever. Okay. Okay, so Jewish education, less anti-Israel activity in the screen in front of you, Israel education, Torah and God are exciting, relevant and meaningful. The nations claim on the surface, why should the Jews claim ownership of this land? And the deeper part. Right, the, on the surface, why should the Jews claim ownership of the land? Why should the Jews claim ownership of this physical land if Jewish identity is rooted in the Torah's spiritual practices? Okay, why should the Torah dignify the nations with an answer? Isn't it odd for Torah to begin with this? Okay, because this is the forming of a nation. You see, the Jewish people... Torah and mitzvot is synonymous with the land of Israel. See, why is it so important for the Jews to have a land? Because you cannot fulfill the Torah without the physical land. The physical land belongs to us. There's a bracha, there's a blessing in the physical land. There's actually Torah and mitzvot, which can only be fulfilled when you're living in Israel. Do you know that most of the laws today, when you're living in New York, that don't apply only when you're living in Israel, today in 2021, for example, what? Shemitah, all the laws of the land, today don't apply. Like, for example, this is a Shemitah year. In the eighth year, when you go to Israel, you need a heksher for fruits and vegetables. Do you know that? When you go buy a New York tomato, you don't need a heksher on a tomato. When you go buy a tomato in Israel, you need a heksher. You need to make sure this is non shmita Many, many, most of the like 613 laws only apply and associated with the land. If we would form a land in Uganda or South Africa, then no, it doesn't, it doesn't have. In other words, being a Jew is synonymous with being in Israel. And as we'll see soon, it's synonymous with being in every inch of Israel. The green line, the red line, the purple line, every line. Every line is ours. Why? Because God gave it to us as a gift. And therefore, the two-state solution doesn't work as a without getting into the politics of it, um, just into the, into the Torah part of it. Okay. 
Um, so one second. Okay. The forming of a nation. You see, when when you what what makes the French a French French? What what, what makes you French? You live in France, right? You live in France. You're French. You maybe you speak the French country. Right? That's what makes you French. What makes you South African? If you're born in South Africa or live there, but what makes you Jewish? It's very different, right? What makes you Jewish? It's got nothing to do with the physical land. Let's see text number nine. The Jewish nation is only a nation through its Torah. It has nothing to do with the physical land. you French because you're born in French. You're Italian because you have a connection to the land of Italy. But you're Jewish, it has nothing to do with the land. And what's the significance of that? Other nations, you see, bound by geography. The Jewish nation is bound by Torah. Look at the Rebbe's letter um, in text number 10 in front of you. An objective, unprejudiced survey of the long history of our people will at once bring to light the reality that our survival as a nation was not the result of material wealth or physical strength. Even during the most prosperous times under the united monarchy of King Solomon, the Jewish people, as well as its country, were materially insignificant by comparison with contemporary world empires such as Egypt, Assyria, and Babylonia. In other words, during King Solomon's times, we were the most powerful ever, and we were still nothing in numbers or in power compared to the other empires. Nor was it in our act of statehood or the control of our geographic homeland that secured our existence, as is evidence from the reality that there was a vast majority of our history, our people have lived in exile without a kingdom, without a homeland. So what secured us? Number one, it wasn't the prosperity of living in Israel, because even when we were at our peak in Israel, we were never like one of the ancient empires. And number two, it wasn't the fact that we lived in Israel, because most of the time we didn't live in Israel. Similarly, our Hebrew language did not play a pivotal role in our perpetuation, for even in biblical times, the Aramaic supplanted the holy tongue as a spoken language to the extent that parts of the scripture, almost all the Babylonian Talmud, the Zohar, and other key words, works were composed in Aramaic instead of Hebrew. Later, in the times of Rabbi, Rabbi Sajjah, Gaon, and Maimonides, most of the Jewish masters spoke Arabic, and further down the line, it was Yiddish and other languages. Today, you could say it's English, you know? So it wasn't the Hebrew language that kept us. It also impossible to describe any common secular culture or contemporary scientific knowledge as a major preservation factor for our people, since such matters morphed radically from one era to another. The only remaining consideration, the only thing that is unified and united us, which is the sole factor that has remained consistent throughout the ages in all lands and under the fullest diversity of circumstances of Torah and Mitzvot that the Jews have observed in their daily life with great self-sacrifice. But the Hebrew language was a big deal, no? I mean, but was the, it always? Yeah, because like the education from age three and the cheder and that learning Hebrew was what created the 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 learning culture and what. what but which language the Talmud in? Yeah, it's written in another language, but anyone who has studied the Talmud will have learned Hebrew in order to. But in the days the of the Talmud, the main language was 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 Aramaic. And in the days of the Rambam, the main language was Arabic. Most Jews spoke Arabic. They didn't speak Hebrew. Okay, but they studied Hebrew. But not most Jews. Most Jews didn't even know it. I just do not understand. Yeah. Like, so, when I'm from Pakistan originally, my, um, it was part of communism. My parents' parents were both, like, the older generation were the ones that, like, learned in Hebrew, and they knew, like, they had Hebrew prayer books. Right, you didn't know. It. Yeah, but, that, but that's also why they use the Hebrew alphabet, right? Aramaic is Hebrew alphabet, Yiddish is Hebrew alphabet, all the Arabic languages, uh, Jewish Arabic languages use Hebrew alphabet. That's that's what so there was the preservation. So the preservation of it, but is that what kept us? Alive for 4,000 years? It's part of it. So Torah is, if you're talking about yeah. from a study perspective, I would say that's part of Torah yeah, as well. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it's um, But the point is like this. Other nations require a land to form their identity. Jews don't need a land to form our identity. Our identity is because we study Torah. That's our identity. So 
So this is one way of explaining why throughout the ages, down to this day, non-Jews are saying, we don't need the land of Israel. But we don't need it because Jews have always have survived, not because of Israel, just barely, but yeah. So why is it that God told us that we need the land of Israel? Why is the land of Israel so critical to our survival? If, if, if really we didn't have it most of the time, why is that? Because there's a reason why we need Israel. See, Israel is not just French living in France because they need to be French. That's where, that's where the French live. But Israel, it's not just that we need Israel because we need a place to live. That's not what it's about. We don't live in Israel because we need a place to live. No, the Italians need a place to live. The South Africans need a place to live. New York, we need a place to live. Israelis need a place to live. No, nothing to do with that. It's much, much deeper than that. Our connection to the land of Israel is something so deep. Look at text 11. The response to this is the relationship between the Jewish people and the land of Israel is unique. It is not comparable to the relationship between any other nation and its homeland. Rather, the Jewish land is an integral part of the Jewish people's spiritual mission. The ultimate goal of the Jewish people's divine service is to turn this tangible world into a home for godly revelation to the point that God's holiness dwell specifically in the physical reality of this world. For this reason, the majority of the Torah's commandments involve physical activities so that the fulfillment of Torah mitzvot installs sanctity into tangible materials. It was therefore critical to provide the Jews with the land of Israel, physical land, to provide them with an abundance of mitzvot that can be performed exclusively with this land, for this expresses the entire goal of the Jewish people and the purpose of Torah to conquer the physical dimension of the world and transform it into a, a home for God. In other words, the reason why we are here is to take the physical and transform, make it holy. So the Jews, by being in Israel, they make the land holy. And that's why there's mitzvot associated with the land of Israel. And that is the answer why you cannot give back land. It's like, this is the holiest thing. Every inch of the land of Israel is holy. I remember going to Efrat, Efrat town in Israel as a young kid, five years old maybe. And I remember there's a, there's a lady there. She said, Ba'afar Eretz Yisrael, Asur lelachlech, Mutar leitlachlech. I was a kid, five years old, getting dirty in the soil over there. My mother was like, oh, you're getting dirty. So the lady said, in the soil of Israel, you're allowed to get dirty, but you're not allowed to dirty it. Meaning the land is so holy. It's like the physical land is holy. Every inch of the land of Israel is holy. We're not living, if we're living there like the Italians are living in Italy, and the neighbors want part of the land, and yeah, sure, you know what, you guys... We'll make peace with you. We'll give you some of the land. We'll compromise. But Israel's not like that. We don't have a connection with Israel because we need a place to live. No, we never need a place to live. We have a connection because it's an intrinsic, basic gift from God, which connects us eternally with every inch of the land of Israel. It's a holy soil. It's a holy place. It's not that we negotiate with, it. oh, the poor Palestinians, let them have a little place. No, uh, yeah, we, we're, we're negotiating. It doesn't work that way. It's like the Torah, you know? Are you going to give part of the scroll to somebody else because they're fighting over it? Or are you going to say, no, the whole Torah is holy. We can't negotiate on holiness. Okay? Why indeed does a good Torah tell us God gave us the land of Israel? So the goal of divine service, physical world, and godly revelation. The Jewish mission is compatible with the physical world. To conquer the physical transform it into a home for God. And therefore you need a Jewish space with a Jewish society. Okay, let's just look at the next text. Um, hang on. Oh, that's, that's all for one second. second. So we can develop similar sentiments by providing a rich Jewish education, fostering a love for God, Developing appreciation for the Torah. I check the BDS movement. The BDS, by the way, is the most sophisticated and modern form of anti-Semitism. Uh, boycott Israel, apartheid. I mean, this is this is exactly what we're talking about. Like this is like the the, the the most of what we're talking about. Exactly this, the BDS movement. Okay, hold on. Video here.
Lesson 3, The Promised Land 1. Anti-Semitism seeks legitimacy from the most prestigious authority of any given era. At present, this authority is the pursuit of human rights. Consequently, many of today's anti-Semites focus overwhelmingly on Israel and accuse it of being the ultimate violator of human rights. 2. When Israel is a. demonized, or b. judged with a double standard, or c. when Israel's existence is delegitimized, the challenge exposes itself as an expression of anti-Semitism. 3. When anti-Semites refrain from asserting that they seek to annihilate Jewry, but merely take issue with specific Jewish beliefs or practices, claiming them to be barbaric, Jews can be tempted to join the fight against their fellow Jews, believing that they are saving Jews rather than hurting them. 4. There are several arguments for why Jews need and have a right to Israel. Most crucial is the Torah's oft-reiterated reminder that God gave Jews the land of Israel as an eternal inheritance. The deeper our appreciation of this reality and the more we educate the next generation about its implications, the more support we will nourish toward the land of Israel. Such an approach can desirably influence the wider audience, but the most vital audience is our Jewish brothers and sisters. 5. To support Torah and God-based reasoning, it is necessary to create an environment that cherishes the Torah and nurtures faith. It is therefore critical to provide a robust Jewish education to ourselves and to the next generation. 6. Jews are a nation not because of our land, but because of our Torah. Nevertheless, the land is important to the Torah's vision for the world inasmuch as it embodies the Jewish mission on earth to infuse physicality with holiness.